webinar on the Minnesota draft of the BEAD initial proposal one and two. Again, BEAD is Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, our IIJA program um, that includes the $652 million uh, in federal dollars for broadband deployment. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Bree Mackey. I'm the Executive Director here at the Office of Broadband Development. Um, Diane Wells will be leading the webinar. Diane has been um, our lead on this uh, incredibly huge lift um, and is the deputy director here. Many other team members at the Office of Broadband are on this call. And as always, um, we are here to be resources um, to all of you as you need us. Um, our contact information is on our website as well as the draft initial proposal and all of the instructions on how you can make public comments. Um, we just really wanted to provide a forum to walk through um, the proposal itself, um, also why things are in there the way they are. Um, just as a note, what we really did try to do um, because the legislature here uh, directed us to put all of our B dollars in, and go through our existing programs. Um, however, um, some of the guidelines with NTIA, which is the federal program, our federal agency in charge of administrating uh, this program, um, we uh, wanted to make sure that our proposals reflect what we feel at the state um, feel is a strong program, um, though we are taking public comments and we'll review those, um, but then we will be um, submitting that to NTIA before uh, December 27th deadline. So again, the, the public comment period runs until December 12th, um, and we encourage you to go on and make uh, public comments that are both um, areas of which you all have concerns for, but also areas of which um, you think are really strong and support the programs and the work we're trying to do here in Minnesota so that we can um, make a case for why our proposals um, should be considered strong when it goes to um, the reviewing committees. So with that, um, I just want to thank the team for the really hard work on this and especially, like I said, Diane, for leading it. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Diane um, to get us started. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone, for attending and for those of you that might be watching the recorded version after the fact. Um, I thought it would be helpful if we provided some background information on the BEAD program initially. Uh, it is a confusing program. And then when you add that into the fact that we have um, the same border to border program with different funding sources. So we have to tweak it each time it gets even more confusing. Um, but the the bead funding comes from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So if we can go to the next slide. And the IIJA was signed into law in mid November of 2021. So we're over two years into um, that program and it it allocated funding um, to Minnesota and to all eligible entities. And when I say eligible entities, that's the 50 states and I believe it's six territories that were eligible to receive bead funding um, as well as separately some tribal entities. Um, but the IIJA made available $65 billion for broadband nationwide and the bead program has 42.5 billion. The other large piece of the program is for digital equity work, which is um, great because it's helping to fund that need in Minnesota and other states, but that's a separate program. And so our focus today is going to be on bead. The allocations to the eligible entities were based on the number of unserved locations on new maps that the FCC created and released early in 2023. The allocations were announced in June and Minnesota's is just about $652 million. And with that bead funding, um, NTIA, as Bree said, is administering this program, and NTIA is the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and it is an agency within the U.S. Department of Commerce. But the BEAD funding priorities are, um, number one, to get service to all unserved locations, and an unserved location is, the, uh, is a location identified on the FCC or Federal Communications Maps 
that doesn't have a white, uh, broadband service at speeds of at least 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload from a broadband service provided over a wired connection or a licensed fixed wireless connection. And then priority number two with this funding is to get service to all underserved locations. And those are locations identified on the FCC map, again, as not having a broadband service from a wired or licensed fixed wireless. Um, but uh, they have it at 25.3 reportedly, but not at or above 100 by 20. So if you're familiar with Minnesota's state speeds outlined in statute, the speeds match up, but the the technology um, is different in the definition for the NTIA's priorities. The third priority is uh, to get gigabit symmetrical service to community anchor institutions. Um, and then if you have funding over left over after you achieve all three priorities and can document that, then you can use uh, funding for um, non-deployment purposes. So if you, we go to the next slide. The bead steps uh, in Minnesota date back to the 2022 session when the Minnesota legislature directed that any funding from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act for broadband that would flow to Minnesota should go through the state's existing border to border grant programs. And so what we've done in the draft initial proposal is to detail Minnesota's plans for how to distribute that bead funding. Um, including the challenge process, uh, eligible locations, and how we'll select subgrantees using our existing border to border programs. And um, our estimates are that we're going to need all of the funding of that $652 million uh, to address priorities one and two, which is deployment to get service to locations that are unserved or underserved and there won't be funding left over to do gigabit symmetrical speeds to community anchor institutions, and there won't be funding left over for non-deployment purposes. We're anticipating the challenge process will be in early 2024, and if you're familiar with Minnesota's border to border program, you know that we run a challenge process after the applications have been submitted in a grant round, and that's for the purpose of identifying any locations that would get served um, that are served by a provider perhaps from recent investment that aren't reflected on our maps um, and we're unknown to the applicant or um, where a provider has plans to build. So we wanna make sure we're not giving public funding to locations that are in line to receive broadband service through other programs or um, private investment. So that challenge process happens after the applications are submitted in our border to border program. This B challenge process, it's probably best to think about it in terms of establishing a starting point. It's held at the front end of all of our subgrantee selection for bead, and it will determine um, the locations that are eligible for the bead funding. So if you're not on that list, once it's set after the challenge process, um, your location wouldn't be able to, re to receive broadband service funded with bead funding. Next slide, please. All right, so the, the bead has a timeline um, with a number of reports that need to be submitted. Minnesota's first report was the five-year action plan, and that's been available online since July 12th. And basically that laid out what Minnesota has done to date in terms of broadband deployment. Um, so it was more of a factual report. Um, the bead initial proposal, which is what we'll, we're talking about today, um, that timeline is the same for all of the eligible entities. Uh, Everyone is due within 180 days of the funding announcement or the allocation announcements, which was late June. So the initial proposals have to be submitted to NTIA no later than December 27th. And then after the initial proposals are reviewed and approved, um, we would select our subgrantees, and then a final proposal is due 365 days after the initial proposal. NTIA has broken the initial proposal down into volumes one and two, and both volumes need to have a public comment period of at least 30 days. So Minnesota's public comment period uh, is the same for both volumes. Um, we think that's um, less confusing to folks. And so the public comment period opened on November 13th and closes on December 12th. Um, the bead challenge process, 
per the NTIA guidelines can occur after the volume one is approved and the volume two has been submitted. We'll be some, um, sending in both of our volumes at the same time, um, but with both of them being due at the end of December um, and NTIA indicating that they're going to approve the volume ones first and then turn and approve the volume twos, um, we're hoping we'll, or anticipating that we'll be opening the challenge process in the first quarter of 2024. Um, with the uh, schedule outlined by NTIA um, in our conversations with them, if they approve all of the volume ones and twos by March of 2024, that means the 365 day clock would start ticking and our final proposals would be due March of 2025 and the final proposals identify all of the sub grantees that would be selected to build out broadband infrastructure um, and then be included in that final proposal and have to be approved by NTIA. Um, under the NTIA guidelines projects um, have to complete within four years and that's four years after the final proposal has been approved by NTIA and the execution of the contracts between the eligible entity the state and the subgrantee. Um, so under that timeline, if we're looking at um, the volume one and two submitted in March of 2024, final proposals submitted in March of 2025, and these would be the earliest deadlines, um, then NTIA would take some time to approve that final proposal. So maybe it's April or May. And at that point, when we have the approval of the final proposal, then we can fully execute the contracts with the subgrantees. So we're in the latter half of 2025 by that point, um, and four years would would start from the date of the fully executed contract in that second half of 2025. So we're looking at the four-year expiration to complete construction being the second half of 2029. Um, and then the eligible entity with the approval of NTIA can extend up to one year if there is a specific plan for use of the funds and a specific end date less than a year out. So this is if a contract needs to be extended because construction isn't done for, for a good reason. So that would push it into 2030. Um, so just to set expectations about when the infrastructure would be placed, under this program, likely uh, start late 2025 at the earliest, um, really getting um, a, more and more of it done and it started anyway in 2026. So we probably wouldn't see any service coming online until uh, some locations in 2026, more so in 27 and 28 probably. Next slide. Um, so what we have here are our bead volume one and volume two, and um, the requirements are broken out. Some are in volume one and some are in volume two. Um, there are 20 requirements that are to be addressed in the initial proposal, and volume one has requirements three, five, six, and seven. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them, but it, um, the documents are online. Requirement three is to list um, all of the existing broadband funding, and so that would include state. Uh, general revenue funding that we've run through the border to border and uh, low population density programs, capital projects funding, which um, was the bulk of the funding in the awards that we announced in December of 2022 and June of 2023, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, RDOF, which is an FCC program, Reconnect, which is a U.S. Department of Ag program. Um, our small cities group did some HUD funding for broadband. And then there's another smaller Community Connect program that USDA runs. Um, there's also some congressionally directed spending that's been used to, to build out broadband, but all of these funding sources have been and um, continue to be used for broadband deployment. So we'll be capturing those locations um, to make sure that that they're removed from the eligible list of locations for BEAD since they'll be getting broadband service from these other programs. Um, requirement five is the location IDs for all unserved and underserved locations. So an, an unserved and underserved location generally has an address. It has a latitude and a longitude, and now it also has a fabric ID that's been assigned by the um, Federal Communications Commission with its mapping vendor, CostQuest. So it can all get kind of confusing as to how you identify a location. 
um, but we'll be using the location IDs under requirement five and compiling a list based on the latest FCC map at the time we submit. Requirement six is the definition and location of all community anchor institutions. And we have had um, a layer showing community anchor institutions on our map since the um, American uh, Rescue Plan Act fund, or American Rescue Reinvestment Funding in 2010. Um, and so we've started from that list and added to it some township hall um, location information we received recently from the Minnesota Association of Townships. And then requirement seven is the, the bead challenge process. Next slide. Um, this is a timeline that we included in our five year action plan. Um, we think it's a little bit more realistic. Um, it does have a little bit later timelines than I discussed previously. Um, as you can see here, the digital equity plan, which is part of that other funding out of the total IIJA funding for broadband, our draft, Minnesota's draft was submitted in November, so it's currently under review by the NTIA. Um, as I indicated, our initial proposal will be submitted by late December. Um, we're anticipating the challenge process in first quarter. NTIA approving both volumes of the initial proposal should be by or before July of 2024. Um, and then our plan is to hold three subgrantee selection rounds, September of 24, January of 25, May of 25, and then submit the final proposal to NTIA by that one year after their approval, which we have here would be July of 2025. Um, give them a few months to approve the final proposal, October of 2025, execute contracts late in 2025, and then that construction compliance auditing validating um, four year period, um, 2026 to 2030. So this program has it, or this timeline has it slipping a little bit. Um, with construction not starting until 2026, which is conceivable given Minnesota's short construction season um, with the ground freezing up so you can't bury fiber generally from about mid-October until thaw in May. Next slide, please. All right, requirement three, as I mentioned, was the existing broadband funding. So this, this is taken from our five-year action plan. Um, but it notes the sources of the fundings, um, which entity is administering it, the total amount allocated to Minnesota, um, how much has it been expended and what's available. Next slide. Um, requirement five is the location IDs. So it's basically two um, CSV or data sheets that will be submitted um, with all of the un and underserved locations. And then, um, Again, the definition for an unserved location is one that lacks reliable broadband service with speeds uh, below 25 down and three up, and then latency less than or equal to 100 milliseconds. And an underserved location is not unserved, but lacking access to reliable broadband service of speeds not less than 100 meg down and 20 meg up. And then the reliable broadband service definition, which is broadband available via, via fiber, cable modem or hybrid fiber, coax, DSL or terrestrial fixed wireless using entirely licensed spectrum or a hybrid of licensed and unlicensed spectrum, including licensed by rule, which is the old um, CBRS spectrum. Next slide. So I just put this map in here, it's it's based on an, a little bit earlier iteration of the FCC map, but it shows what the FCC data is showing as eligible for bead funding. So the red locations on this map, and again, it's high level. So if you drill down um, and you can do that on our map or on the FCC maps to show if your particular location is eligible, um, it'll show up as red on this map, um, not having a reliable broadband service at speeds of at least 25 by 3. The orange locations on this map are reported to have a reliable broadband service of 25 by 3, but not at or above the 100 by 20. And then the green locations on the map are reported to have service from a reliable broadband service technology of 100 by 20. Um, and as you know, if you're familiar with our border to border and lower population density programs, we have historically by law only considered wired broadband service in determining whether a reliable broadband service is available. 
um, the challenge process has to issue or follow the guidelines that have been issued by NTIA. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about what we have in our challenge process, um, but the ultimate outcome of that challenge process will be overseen and approved by NTIA. Next slide. Um, for the community anchors, um, again, I touched on this a little bit, but we def we are to define what is all included as a community anchor um, and then identify the locations in the state. We've been doing that since about 2010, so we have um, identified addresses for those community anchors and the township association uh, town hall locations and included that as part of our volume one. Um, our assumption is that if you represent a community anchor institution and you're not already identified on the map and you haven't previously identified for us that you should be on the map over the last 10 years or so that that data has been up, um, you can indicate that in the public comment period and then um, we'll look at whether you meet the definition and then we can add you. Um, keep in mind that uh, Minnesota does not anticipate having any funding to deploy gigabit speeds to community anchors, which is that priority three. Um, and so in conversations with NTIA, um, because it's not going to be a focus of our funding, you know, we put in the um, commensurate amount of work to identify those community anchors. Some of the states that will be able to do uh, gigabit speeds to community anchors had um, you know an all-out effort to to define and identify those um, because we'd had a definite you know a definition and identification of those and we don't have funding we went with the list that we have with the ability to um, add to that during the public comment period. Next slide. All right, the bead challenge process. So uh, you the eligible entities had the option of adopting the NTIA bead model challenge process. I think most states are. There were also some optional modules that eligible entities could elect to adopt. So um, in our initial proposal, we are proposing that we would adopt NTIA's optional module two, which would treat all locations that have qualifying broadband service delivered um, by DSL, which is the copper telephone network, as underserved. So if you were in a location reported to have service at or above 100 by 20 with DSL technology, um, this module that we're adopting would have you classified as underserved. Um, we're also adopting the NTI optional module three that will treat as underserved or unserved um, those locations that can demonstrate through the challenge process speed test module that while they may be reported as served, um, they are, um, if your speeds are below, below, materially below 100 by 20 upload or below 25 download and three upload, you could be reclassified as underserved or unserved. And then we've also proposed a fixed wireless modification, actually two. First would um, is a, a proposal that would bring uh, our definitions from state law into the bead process, which is that you'd be eligible for bead funding if e you only had a fixed wireless reported service um, at or above the 25.3 or 100 by 20. If that's not approved by the NTA, then we would um, go with a module that those lacking service other than by fixed wireless um, would be considered un or underserved and that the fixed wireless provider would have the burden of proof to challenge and show that they can get you service at or above the 100 by 20. Again, those are subject to NTA's approval. Um, we are planning or will conduct the bead model challenge process using a vendor that um, will establish a portal to submit the challenges and supporting documentation. Individuals will be able to submit information into the portal. Um, so, you, you know, individuals can do the speed test. Individuals can submit documentation from a provider saying they couldn't get you service or there is an excess construction fee. Um, and then official challenges for NTIA requirements can only be submitted by the local government or tribal governments, nonprofits, and broadband service providers. So what the portal will enable is individuals to go in and submit information and then we'll 
roll that up and work with a local government or nonprofit to submit those as actual challenges. Um, so once the initial list of eligible locations, that's that'll be submitted um, based on the FCC maps and our um, deduplication process where we'll remove those locations that are getting service from another funding source. Um, and then the, the locations that are left will go through the challenge process and they can be challenged on broadband availability, speed, the latency exceeding um, what's allowed for reliable broadband service. If there's an unreasonable data cap, if the technology listed is wrong, um, if it if it shows as eligible, but it's really only a business service that's available, not a residential, then it would be challengeable. Um, if a provider could challenge because they do have an enforceable commitment that we might have missed in our deduplication process, or if they have plans to serve. Um, again, if they're not part of an enforceable commitment, it could get challenged. Um, and then um, if it's a community anchor institution, it wouldn't be eligible for bead funding under NDI guidelines right now, so it could be challenged. And so will it, um, and then we're also going to accept challenges for multiple dwelling units so that those would have to come in um, three units within the MDU or 10% of the unit count, whichever is larger in order to make that a credible challenge. And then um, there'll be a rebuttal period and then our office will adjudicate. Um, and so there's 30 days for official challenges to be submitted, 30 days for rebuttal, and then um, we will adjudicate and make a final determination within 30 days of the challenge rebuttal. Next slide. And then I should say that that challenge process, when it concludes, that would be the final list that would be submitted to NTA is eligible for bead funding. Um, bead volume two gets a little bit more into some of the policy issues, not uh, so much the, the black or white issues. Um, and volume two includes requirements one, two, four, and then eight through 20. And this lists what those are. Requirement one is objectives, two, local tribal and regional broadband planning processes, four, coordination, eight, deployment subgrantee selection, nine, non deployment subgrantee selection, which we won't have in Minnesota. Uh, eligible entity implementation activities. Requirement 11 is labor standards and protection, and 12 is workforce readiness. And then the next slide has um, minority business enterprises, labor surplus area firms inclusion, cost and barrier reduction, climate assessment. Uh, 16 is low cost broadband service option. 20, I think it moved up in the list. So the middle class of affordability plan is under the low cost option. And then some areas that we need to address just more from the eligible entities needs, use of 20% funding, the regulatory approach and certification of compliance with bead requirements. So, so the objectives, we um, took those from our five-year action plan and they really just tie back to the broadband goals that are outlined in statute, which kind of are what guides all of our work is to make sure locations um, by 2026, have all locations have access to at least one provider with download speeds of at least 100 megabits per second and upload speeds of at least 20 megabits per second. Next slide. Um, this is the local, tribal, and regional broadband planning processes. And you can look back through the history of this office, um, which was created in legislative, um, the legislative session in 20. 13. And then that winter, the 2013-2014 winter, there were meetings held around the state to gather input on the creation of a border-to-border -border grant program, which was done in the 2014 session. Um, we did include a list of all of the meetings, or as many as we had documentation for, um, going back to 2013 in our five-year action plan. And then the volume two really has the meetings that we've held uh, since the bead funding became available or was announced. Um, in terms of broadband planning, uh, Minnesota also has a couple of other tools that have been used to help plan for broadband and to hear um, feedback on the program. One of those is the Governor's Task Force on Broadband, which has been around since 2011. 
different versions, um, but always there. And it consists of multi-stakeholder representation. And generally, there's been a public comment period on um, each meeting agenda for feedback from the public on the task force, the office, the grant program, anything related to broadband. Um, the, the broadband program goals and funding have pretty much been reviewed each legislative session and upgraded um, frequently through law changes. And so the program has been kept current. Um, Minnesota has an ongoing tribal engagement process. I know our office has um, presented at the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council a few times over the years, and then individually with tribes um, through DEEDS Tribal Liaison. And there's been an, an, a big emphasis the last six months with this bead funding to uh, work with the tribes so that we understand each other's needs for the bead funding. And then the Office of Broadband has uh, pretty much annually participate, at least annually participated, um, either by attending or presenting at association meetings, such as the League of Minnesota Cities, the Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, the Minnesota Association of Townships, the Minnesota Cable Communications Association, the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, the Economic Development Association of Minnesota, the Minnesota Association of Professional Community and Economic Development Directors. I think that's what MAPSED means. Um, and then at regional economic development meetings. And for those of you that have been in the broadband space for a number of years, you're also familiar with um, the work that our office had done with Blandon when Blandon was operating in the broadband space to co-host um, an annual conference, which I think we probably did for 10 years anyway, um, at least. So, you know, long, long standing involvement uh, to engage with uh, those interested in broadband with the public to make sure that the programs that we administer are responding to the needs of Minnesotans in terms of broadband. Next slide. Um, this is the local coordination, again, frequent speaking engagements, consul consultations, both with groups and, you know, one on one with um, people and um, companies. Um, we have information on our website, which is, you know, much more robust than it was when we first opened the office 10 years ago. Um, we have flyers, handouts, in-person meetings, virtual meetings, both during the pandemic and continuing. Um, we've had webinars related to each grant round request for proposal and um, a webinar on how to use our maps. We pride ourselves on being available by email and phone and responding to calls and uh, questions. And a lot of that um, relevant to BEAT anyway is, is in that local coordination tracker tool that's attached to the volume two. Requirement eight is the Deployment subgrantee selection, and this is the process that we would use to select those recipients that would build out the broadband infrastructure. Um, as I noted, Minnesota law requires that bead funding be distributed through our existing border to border programs. And we have links to the application material provided in our volume two. Um, and that application would be used to judge the financial, technical, managerial and operational capacity of an applicant. Um, we follow the Minnesota Department Office of Grants Management policies for our border to border program, and we would follow those for BEAD. Um, BEAD also requires that all unserved locations receive service before underserved locations are considered. And so unserved locations would be the focus of the, the two of the first three, the first two of three planned grant rounds. Um, and so we may um, need to directly negotiate with providers or applicants in adjacent areas to make sure we're getting those unserved locations addressed before we would be able to turn to fund underserved locations. So that would be a requirement of bead that we would be building into our border to border program. And then um, what we plan to do is um, allow applicants to consider to choose their project areas. Some of the eligible entities are identifying areas and only accepting applications for the specified areas. 
we prefer to keep running the program as we do with border to border and allow applicants to choose their project area. But again, potentially negotiating with them if the project is adjacent to some unserved locations that we need to get to. Slide. Um, there may be areas where we don't have a provider willing to serve after that planned third grant round and there we would request in the final proposal submitted to NTIA that those locations default to existing fixed wireless or low earth orbit orbiting satellite services and be addressed in any future state grant funded round the RDOF 2 uh, reconnect community connect um, and other grant funding that might come up um, there is a scoring rubric that's attached to the volume two and that would come into play if we have locations with competing grant applications and there um, the funding categories some of those are identified by NTIA where points have to be assigned for example the match amount should get points under NTIA guidelines there are points for affordability and for fair labor practices and those are the primary criteria that would account for 75 percent of the points and then under the secondary criteria, the one required by NTIA is speed to deployment. And so we have uh, five points for that. And then we've added in a, um, points for deploying to higher speeds and then points for demonstrations of community support. Um, we have prioritized border to border um, as a partnership between an applicant and a community and so we want to see that demonstration of community support because that tells us the project is going to be more successful because the community backs that applicant and members um, will subscribe to the service offered if there's a, that partnership. Next slide. Again, like I said, requirement nine is the non-deployment subgrantee selection and there, we will be using all of the funding for deployment so we we don't, this isn't applicable to Minnesota. Um, uh, requirement 10 is um, our state, our implementation activities. So um, these are activities that we would be undertaking without making a subgrant. And so some of the 600 or almost $652 million would be used for, um, well, the 5 million initial planning grant has already been um, assigned to Minnesota and we're using that for staffing permitting assistance some cost analysis um, and then when we get into the remainder of the allocation it would be um, implementing the bead challenge process since we'll be hiring a vendor to um, open, open that portal for us and then we'll have some administration costs for the bead program um, and then mapping and data collection and then validating that the projects have been constructed. But the bulk of the BEAT allocation is intended to be used for awarding subgrants to uh, recipients that will build out broadband infrastructure to those un and underserved locations. Requirement in 11 is labor standards and protect protections. And so um, applicants for the bead funding will have to verify that they comply with federal law and employment laws and certify that they and their subcontractors have consistently complied and that they have not been found to have violated such laws um, as OSHA for the preceding three years and then uh, our office does require reporting on compliance number of employees and contractors number of direct or sub third party hires wages and benefits etc uh, for the capital projects funding and we will we'll continue to do that for bead funded projects and any additional um, components that bead would um, require us by NTIA's guidelines to include in the application and and um, follow up compliance requirements. Next slide. 12 is workforce readiness so our office um, has partnered since we're part of the department of employment and economic development we have the workforce area um, right with indeed so rather than stand up and try to figure out how to address broadband workforce needs within our little 12 person office we're going to rely on the experts at deed um, which is the workforce development side, governors, workforce development board, workforce services and transformation, et cetera, um, to address 
the broadband workforce needs holistically as they're looking at all of the employment needs, um, especially those coming out of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which would be, you know, uh, transportation infrastructure, clean energy um, workforce. Um, so addressing that um, together. Um, and also we we have been sharing with um, our associations, our cable and telecom association information for at least the last couple of years on workforce training programs that DEED administers if there was interest um, in having a partnership with DEED and a, a local college in training for specific um, work, workforce needs. I know Excel Energy has used that program. I, our cable and telcos have not, so it apparently hasn't been um, a necessity yet, but it is there um, for them to use, and um, we've been sharing that information with them. Um, requirement 13, again, uh, the min minority business enterprises labor surplus. Um, these are included in the grant contract template language, and so it requires grantees to take all necessary steps to assure that targeted vendors from businesses with active certifications are used when possible. Um, the contracts require certifications on non-discrimination and equal opportunity, and we can build into the grant contract template language any additional requirements that NTIA um, mandates for us to use. Requirement 14 is cost and barrier reduction, and that's defined as promoting the use of the existing infrastructure, dig one's policies, streamlining permitting processes, cost effective access to poles, conduits, and easements, and streamlining rights of way. Um, so the border to border grant applicants for a number of years, we've had a question on there where they can identify whether their proposed project is leveraging existing broadband networks. Uh, whether funded privately or from prior projects, or if they'll be built in conjunction with other projects. So, I, you know, in the past we've had applicants tell us, well, they're going to use our program and their RDOF funding and build out adjacent areas at the same time. It's just one example. Um, Minnesota has also had a Dig Ones policy in place since I think 2013. And MnDOT works pretty closely with broadband providers to notify them in advance, um, like in their five-year plan, of road construction projects in the event that um, a provider would want to deploy infrastructure at the time the road is opened. And then we have also been using the Minnesota Business First Stop organization um, for a number of years, again, to address permitting issues as they arise. And in fact, last year, um, a broadband subgroup was stood up specifically to address permitting issues related to broadband, knowing that um, we had significant funding from the Capital Projects Fund and that this bead funding was coming. And we are aware that there are some bumps in the road um, with permitting recently, um, and we are working to get those addressed or at least understood and expectations set um, before the bead funding um, becomes available um, so that folks can include any increased costs or timelines related to those permitting issues um, in their proposed budgets and project timelines. Um, requirement 15 is a climate assessment and NTIA did provide some climate resiliency resources um, to help guide the development of this section of volume two. And so we went through those and Minnesota um, doesn't seem to have any particular area of the state that's more heavily impacted by climate change issues than other areas. I mean, we're not a coastal state, so that explains part of the reason why. Um, but um, we did identify um, that there will be more extreme weather events and um, drought, um, but that not any particular area of the state or group of counties is more likely to suffer from that. Um, otherwise, we do, the legislature did create in the 2023 session a new um, Governor's Infrastructure Resilience Advisory Task Force. Well, actually, it might have been an executive order for the governor's task force. Anyway, Bree Mackey 
Um, our executive director is a member of that task force, and so she will be participating in conveying issues related to broadband and bead requirements as part of her work on the task force and taking, you know, bringing back her learning from that task force as well to address requirement 15. Requirement 16 is the low cost broadband service option. Um, so border to border grant applicants have to provide the rates that they're going to charge for 100 by 20 service and 100 by 100 service, and then indicate any charges they have for additional equipment or separately chargeable installation items. And then um, they identify their marketing efforts and provide information on how their rates are affordable to the target markets. And so we'll add information specific to BEAD about requiring information on basic service characteristics like latency, data caps, um, any material network management practices. And then um, applicants will have to commit to charge a price for their low cost broadband option to low income households that meet the eligibility requirements for the affordable connectivity plan. And they also have to participate in the, of the it, this is an FCC program, the affordable connectivity program or its successor program. And then we also require that the low cost broadband option has to be priced below the FCC's urban rate comparability benchmark, which is a, a pricing benchmark that the FCC has established to demonstrate that rates in rural areas um, are comparable to rates in urban areas where there is strong competition. Next slide is requirement 20. Um, there's also the B program also requires a middle class affordability plan. And so again, this is where our office's prioritization of applications that demonstrate a strong public private partnership will help assist us um, because it'll demonstrate that the community finds the service to be provided by that applicant to be of high quality and desired by the residents and businesses in the project area at the rates offered by the service provider. So basically, if uh, a community is partnering with a provider, our assumption is that they vetted the rates of that provider and find those rates to be reasonable and that community members um, would subscribe to the service at those rates. And for the middle class affordability plan, we will also make sure that the rates are at or below the FCC's urban rate comparability benchmark. And if need be, ask a, an applicant provider to lower their rates to below that benchmark in order to be awarded a grant. And we did, um, for example, in the December 2022 awards, we did have five companies that we asked to lower their rates in order to receive the grant award. And all five of those were um, rural cooperative companies. So, um, you know, part of it is we want to attract providers without making it burdensome to them by mandating very low rates when those providers do not have the business uh, rate base or the urban rate base to cross subsidize low income households. Um, and that that type of cross subsidization is how telecommunication lifeline rates have always been funded. So, um, so trying to make that a, as minimal a burden as possible on potential applicants so that they'll still participate in the grant program. Next slide. Um, requirement 17 is just, uh, it's the use of the 20% funding. So when we submit the initial proposal, we can request zero funding at the time, 20% uh, or the full 100%. Because of Minnesota's state laws, which would not allow us to issue a request for proposal to select subgrantees without having the money in hand, uh, we will be requesting 100%, although we wouldn't be able to allow it to be used until that final proposal is approved by NTIA. Next slide. Uh, requirement 18 is the eligible entities regulatory approach. And here the NTIA uh, asks whether the eligible entity will waive all laws concerning broadband that would preclude or limit public sector providers from participating uh, in the BEAD program. So Minnesota law specifically lists as eligible applicants for the border to border grant program political subdivisions. There are a couple of laws that have been cited in 
uh, trade press publications as being barriers to broadband deployment by local government entities. One of those is Minnesota Statutes 429.021, um, which doesn't allow a local unit of government to construct broadband facilities if they're um, going to be competing against providers in the private market. Uh, well, if there is broadband service already available, those locations wouldn't be eligible for bead funding anyway, so we don't view that as a barrier. And then uh, Minnesota Statutes 237.19 has also been cited as a barrier, but that specifically applies to telephone exchange service, which is not broadband service, so we don't view that as a barrier to uh, bead funding um, for broadband deployment by a municipality. Uh, requirement 19 is certification of compliance with bead requirements where the eligible entity, the state, has to um, indicate it will comply with all of the requirements. Um, the accountability requirements include distribution of funding by a reimbursement process, which is what we do already with our border to border grant programs, um, an inclusion of a clawback provision, which we have in our contracts timely subgrantee reporting mandates and robust subgrantee monitoring practices, both of which we follow through the Office of Grant Management Practices, so those are not new for us, um, that we will account for and satisfy authorities relating to civil rights and non-discrimination, and that we will ensure subgrantee compliance with cybersecurity and supply chain risk management requirements, which are checkbox requirements in the, the BEAT process. And those are all of the requirements because requirement 20, remember, was that middle income affordability plan that we discussed after the low income plan. Um, we are aware that there are going to be challenges to be deployment. Some of those are listed here. The um, conflicting state and federal speed goals, the definition of broadband, um, whether we'll get applications for all unserved locations, whether Minnesota's, you know, short construction season compared to a Mississippi or a Texas or a Florida where they can build year round. Uh, the time, the time this is all going to take to get built, which is frustrating, I know, to people that wanted good broadband yesterday. Um, external funding sources, how is the match going to be met? The permitting, um, which we are trying to resolve as best we can before we get into the, the bead funded projects. Um, the accurate mapping, that's been a frustration. Uh, supplies and supply chain uh, where we think fiber supplies are adequate from what we're hearing, but there could be components that suffer from shortages. Uh, workforce, again, we'll see. We know there's a lot of, there's in, in-house workforce, there's scheduling of subcontractors with workforce. Um, so we know there there, we're hearing of some issues, not a lot, but not every state has been putting broadband in um, for the last year anyway, so we could see that coming up in the future. Line of credit that was recently modified by the NTIA for in, their, um, in what they had put in the NOFO, um, so we'll see if those changes line up uh, when we hear back from NTIA on our, our, our initial proposal, whether what we have lines up with what they have now allowed. Um, there are a number of reporting requirements for B, which we're trying to get our handle on. Um, the guidance requests and clarification are still rolling out from NTIA, so um, it's been hard to set anything in stone when things keep changing. And I'm sure there are other challenges that we'll discover along the way. All right, so that's kind of the overview. Um, both with the background, the framework, what we have in the initial proposals, and we can try and we'll take your questions. We'll try to answer them. If we don't have an answer, we might need to get back to you. The attendee mics have been unmuted at this time. If you could please use the raise hand feature or chat feature to um, make a comment or ask a question, we'd appreciate that. And then you can unmute, unmute your microphone as we call on you.
So first off, we have Paul Peltier. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Um, I have a question. I have a couple questions. One, um, as far as rolling out the six hundred fifty-one million dollars, um, do we have any idea? And I was on, only able to join a little bit later into the presentation, so I didn't see the beginning part of the presentation. Could you could you remind me if you had shown the state Minnesota map from the FCC at the beginning of this presentation? I know that was map that was shown yes at the previous meeting. Could you go back to that one for a second, or at least make that one available to us? Right, so um, taking a look at that map, there is a, a significant area of the area that I serve, which is the Northeastern Arrowhead region. Uh, St. Louis County in particular is in the upper right hand corner and it's mostly red around that area for lots of reasons because there's public lands in the Superior National Forest, et cetera. But even around uh, major cities, we're having trouble getting projects to pencil out even at 75 percent pre-funded. Uh, some of them are not penciling out at 95 percent pre-funded and we've had targeted meetings with specific broadband companies to try and help them match with a community of interest and they're telling us that they can't get over the line. Um, what fidelity do we have or assurance that money from the $651 million will make it to areas of greater Minnesota that are least served and even though they may be counted as quote served in some ways they are drastically underserved nowhere even coming close to the state broadband goes present or future um and i'm afraid we're going to get left behind again so uh, please address that very wandering question i hope you understand the spirit in which it's intended um there's also some permitting things about already areas that have previously been dug up um what can we do to help accelerate those so i'd, I'd like you to address those items first Sure. Well, first of all, the the almost six hundred and fifty two million dollars that Minnesota has been allocated, we know that that will not be enough to get service to all un and underserved locations. We have argued to NTIA that we should be able to address the applications that our office receives, which have largely been for fiber projects. And NTIA is saying we have to show how we're getting internet to all. So if they enforce that requirement um, in their review and approval of our initial proposal, that'll mean that we will have less fiber deployment if we have to show we're getting something to everyone and we'll be funding more fixed wireless. Um, so that's not good news in terms of your question. Um, we we can ask for a waiver. So we have the border to border program, which allows us to fund up to 50% of the project cost. And then the other 50% match has to come from elsewhere. Um, the bead program allows the eligible entity to fund up to 75%. And that does coincide with our lower population density program. So out of that 652 million, if if our office has the flexibility to shift between programs, we'll be better able to meet a 75% award if need be to get to all of those unserved locations. Um, we don't know if that'll be the case because we have to go through the 2024 legislative session and the legislature might as they've done in the past, directed how much money goes to border to border, how much goes to lower population density. And if because we haven't seen an application yet under right. B, we don't yeah. know if if what they decide will work. You know, um, Diane, Diane, does is the low density pilot program permanent and funded at this point? I know it's still piloted, but well, they changed it in the 2023 session, and so they they refer to it now as the lower population density program. They took out the word pilot, and they did fund it. We have an open grant round right now with applications due on Thursday. So there's $20 million that the legislature directed in the 2023 session for the lower population density program and $30 million for traditional border to border. We will have another grant round of $50 million um, that will open in the spring. That will also have 20 million for lower population density right. and 30 million. But again, the cap is 10 million per project. So potentially right. it could just be two projects. Um, but if if there is a need to go over the 75% funding, we can request a waiver 
from NTIA and they would have to approve the waiver to fund 90% or 100%. But again, it all has to be within showing we're getting broadband to everyone within that $652 million, which is a huge constraint. Um, There is also the, um, we will have to establish a extremely high cost threshold. So if we're seeing costs come in over that threshold, which we will set by round three, um, then we would look towards other technologies. While fiber is prioritized by BEAD, if you're over that extremely high cost threshold, your solution could be a fixed wireless service, whether over licensed or unlicensed, or a satellite service. So now so the, that the, is right. The challenge that we're looking at doing right now that you're describing in this process, just for my information, is is about how the bead allocations will roll out, not for are we going to challenge for more federal money? Because there was an opportunity to do that, but Minnesota didn't do that. Is that correct? There was not an opportunity to challenge for more federal money. There then was how did an Wisconsin op- and Georgia do that. There was an opportunity um, for folks to go into that FCC map and say the data is wrong. And it was a very short window from November, uh, October, November until mid-January. We did send out, uh, Bree Mackey, our executive director, did send out a letter to the editor to all of the newspapers in Minnesota encouraging people to go online and check what was showing as available for their location and challenge the FCC map. So that's um, that. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Next commenter or question, Mark Burkholz. Hi, Diane. Um, thank you for so succinctly putting this together. It's good information. You you do good work. My question was kind of on that seventy five percent. So I have got that got that answered. So when you're talking about the three rounds of applications, are you going to do those by dollar amounts? Or if you get everything covered in the first round, are you going to break them up by the three priorities? Or what do you, what's the you know, office thinking on that? Uh, uh, we would probably, you know, if we could do it all in one round and get all unserved locations addressed um, so we didn't need a second round, uh, I I think we'd make all of the funding available and then just determine um, whether it's needed or not. If we have applicants that meet that gating criteria, they're technically managerial, financially, and operationally capable. That's kind of the gating criteria for BEAD. And if they submit an application and they're the only applicant for those unserved locations, they'll get funded. Yeah. So again, we need to see what those costs are looking like. Um, so I should say, you know, if it's a 50-50 or a 75-25 and the costs look reasonable some from, you know, information we'll have from recent grant rounds and an RFP we're issuing to get some cost data, we would likely fund those um, and then make the remaining funding available in round two. You know, keeping in mind nothing is final until we put it in our final proposal draft to go to NTA where we have to make sure every thing lines up. Um, but I don't see that we'd have a reason, um, especially for those unserved locations, to cap a grant round. Sure. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's good to have multiple grant rounds because the first round, we've got reconnect grants out there. We've got community connect grants out there. We've got a new border to border applications going in. So, it, you know, the first quarter of 2024, we're not going to know whether a location is federally funded or not. So. Yeah, we're hoping. Well, we'll have round nine where the applications are due Thursday decided, and then we're hoping to have round ten um, decided before the first sub grantee selection round. And again, we we don't control the timing on the NTIA side, um, but that's our hope to be able to deduplicate those locations and get them out. We also have line extension. That's kind of an ongoing. Round and you know, granted those aren't 400 and 500 location projects, but you know, they they can be 20, 30 locations that get served. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Diane, I was wondering if you had an opportunity to please post the NTIA map. Can you guys do that for us so that we can see it? 
Is that available anywhere the, online for us on the Office of Broadband Development? The well, we'll put the PowerPoints up. Yeah. Um, but again, if you you know you can look at that red and green map. That's the one you're referring to. Yep. Yeah, and then. Is that one pretty, available? Can we get it anywhere? Or? You, well, it's available on the FCC's website if you know which okay. layers to overlay. Um, okay. But yeah, we'll be posting the PowerPoint. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any further comments or questions? Um, I have put the link to the form for the public comment for the initial proposal on the chat. So the direct link to the form is there. You can also find that link on our homepage. Yeah, and Megan, I would just add that if you have comments, good or bad, um, on the initial proposal, if there's something in there you think we should change, let us know what we you think we should change it to. If there's something in there that you really like, um, it will help support our position with NTIA if we can show that it is supported by Minnesotans, that we've got it um, the way Minnesotans want this plan. You know, while it is a national plan and the NTIA has to approve it, we are trying to stay true to our Minnesota program and our Minnesota needs um, in the preparation of the document. Are there any further questions or comments at this time? Looks like there's no further questions or comments, so if if that's the case, we can wrap up. Thank you everyone for attending and if you do think of questions later on, you can send them to our email box um, if you need something answered prior to submitting any comments or if it's a question and not really a comment. And our general email box is deed, D -E -E -D, dot broadband at state.mn.us. And then if you are submitting comments, they need to be in by four o'clock on Tuesday, December 12th. And you can also mail comments to the addresses here and make sure they're received by us by 4 p.m. on Tuesday, December 12th. Thank you for your attendance. That concludes our webinar.